already. It looks all right. It looks like we're good. All righty, everybody. Um, I want to welcome everyone tonight. Um, my name is Stacy. I'm the executive director here at Bucks County Audubon Society, um, and in our attempt to try and make sure that we're all staying safe and socially distanced, we've decided to do the introductory part of our um, of our annual butterfly count um, virtually tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Diane in just a second to, um, to give us that introduction to butterflies. But I hope everyone will also join us on Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 18th at two o'clock um, at our at our site to be able to actually go out and count butterflies. Um, it will be a nice, fun, socially distant um, activity for everybody. Um, hopefully, the weather will be beautiful. All righty, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Diane. Take it away. All right, well, thanks everybody for being here. Um, this is the introduction to the North American Butterfly Count. Um, and the Butterfly Count is a citizen science project that's been ongoing since 1993. And it covers all of North America, US, Canada, Mexico. And it, uh, it provides a tremendous amount of data for um, scientists to find out about the geographic distribution and the relative population sizes of the species that we're able to count. I'm going to go ahead and start my screen sharing um, so that we can see something about these butterflies that we're going to be learning about and counting. Let's see if I can do this. Okay, do this, do this. Do this and do that. Okay, here we are. All right, so as I was saying, the, the data that we get um, allows us to do comparison across years and it can be used to monitor changes in butterfly populations and study the effects of changes in weather and habitat all across um, North America. So Okay, um, this is something I always like to um, challenge people with because a lot of people um, think that moths are dull and boring and butterflies are all beautiful. So here's a little quiz. Um, you can use the chat box to tell me if numbers one through four are butterflies on, or moths. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. So go ahead. You guys should be able to do this. There's only a couple of us here. Nobody's trying? I don't see any chats. All right, Stacy. Got it. All right, so one and four are in fact moths and two and three are, are butterflies. All right, let's find out some more about butterflies. Oh, come on, don't give me a hard time now. There we go, okay. So some interesting butterfly facts. We have about um, 45 species common in the Delaware Valley. Um, worldwide, there's about 24,000 species. Um, this is always a fun thing with kids that butterflies can taste with their feet. And they use that um, to determine if the plant is suitable for where they wanna lay their eggs. And butterflies can see color, um, particularly reds and greens and yellows. And there's way more species of moths, um, 160 thousand or so. For the purposes of the North American butterfly count, we do not count moths. We only count butterflies. Okay, so here are some of the ways that we can tell the difference. Um, one of the most telling and reliable are the shape of the antenna. On butterflies, they're like um, clubs and they have usually have a bulbous tip, whereas on moths, they're more feathery they have um, got sort of divided, almost fern-like looking um, antenna. And the resting stance, when butterflies land, um, they usually hold their wings together above their backs, um, which makes it really hard to see the beautiful colors on them because the underside of the wing isn't as colorful. 
Um, but moths, when they land, they keep their wings open over their back. And of course, butterflies are active in the day and moths are, attracted, are active at night and they're attracted to light. Um, their pupil form is different. Butterflies make chrysalis and moths either make cocoons or they pupate underground. Okay, so butterflies come in a bunch of different families. Swallowtails, um, whites and sulfurs, coppers, hair streaks and blues, brushfoots, hackberry butterflies, satyrs and wood nymphs, and milkweed butterflies. And we um, are gonna learn something about the characteristics of these that were gonna help us to identify these butterflies on Saturday when we go out and count them. And speaking of Saturday, um, it's probably a good idea to bring some binoculars if you um, want to uh, take a look at butterflies through binoculars. That actually is a, is a good way to watch them and it helps pick up some of the characteristics that make it easier to identify them. All right, so give me my next slide. All right, Stacy, why is it not advancing? There we go. Okay, so roughly um, the butterfly um, life cycle is to lay an egg. They're very, very small. All butterfly eggs are very, very small, size of a pinhead, roughly. They hatch and they are larvae, which is the same as what we would call a caterpillar. Um, and they grow by eating a tremendous amount of food. Um, they start out as these itty bitty little pin sized eggs and turn into caterpillars that can be, you know, as long as the pinky on your hand for some of the species. Um, when they're ready to undergo their metamorphosis, they attach it, it's themselves upside down and form a, uh, a shell around themselves. Now, within the chrysalis, the butterfly undergoes a tremendous change. Um, basically, none of its body parts um, remain the same. The entire butterfly um, changes over. So, they have a completely different mouth than they had when they had a caterpillar. A caterpillar has chewing mouth parts, which is why it attacks all the leaves while it's eating. Um, and butterflies have a straw-like uh, mouth part where, which they use to sip nectar. So um, when the butterflies first emerge out of their chrysalis, their wings are very wet, they cannot fly. So they need to have their chrysalis in a place that's gonna be safe when they emerge from it because it takes them a little while to uh, unravel their wings, um, to pump the blood through their wings, stretch them out, get them to dry, um, and then they can safely fly away. Um, the picture down on the lower right is the scales of a butterfly. One of the things that um, is quite fragile about the butterflies are is the, these scales. That's how they get their beautiful colors, um, but the scales are also necessary for them to fly, which is one of the reasons why we don't handle butterflies. Um, if we try to touch them or catch them and those scales get disturbed, that can really impact their ability to, um, to fly, but we don't wanna do that. All right, let's talk about some of our butterflies. The uh, swallowtail family is one of the most gorgeous that I can I can think of. Um, here's another quiz. Let's see how you guys do. Um, the butterfly in the upper, let's go from upper left around clockwise and put in the chat what you think are those butterflies. Are we getting any chats, Stacy? I'm not watching the chat. We are not, and I have to admit, I'm really terrible at swallowtails. So <laughs> All right. I, I know the ones, but I can I, I'm I always get them wrong, so I'm not even gonna try. All right, so in the upper left, that is a black swallowtail. In the upper right is an 
eastern tiger swallowtail, but in the black phase. Eastern tiger swallowtails come in two colors, the black and the yellow, which is the one on the bottom left, but only the females will come in the black. And the one on the uh, bottom right is a spice bush swallowtail. So what you wanna look at for these cases is the rows of the dots. So if you look at the upper left on that black swallowtail, you can see that it's got um, a, couple, a double row of dots and it's got um, those bright reddish, orangish um, on the hind wing. And if you look at the butterfly on the right, which is the black phase of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, it does not have those um, reddish orange spots. And the, the rows of spots are slightly differently shaped, plus it's got some blue. On the um, Spice Bush Swallowtail, there's only a single row of dots on the hind wings. And the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail is pretty easy. And it's in the yellow phase. This is what a swallowtail caterpillar looks like. And this is a black swallowtail caterpillar. Those uh, big yellow things coming out of its head are called osmeterium, and I don't know what they're used for. Um, I just know that they're kind of odd looking that way. This, here's the spice bush swallowtail. They lay their eggs singly, um, usually on the underside of a leaf, hatch into their caterpillars, and they grow um, and shed their exoskeleton a number of times until they become that um, rather odd looking thing down in the lower left. Um, and then the chrysalis um, on the right is also um, very well camouflaged. It's very difficult to find those. So um, they're not the easiest of them to find. All right. Now, these are some of the more common butterflies that we see. Um, most people think of the cabbage whites, which is um, in the upper left, as moths because they're so bland, but they are not. They are actually butterflies. And the uh, difference between the male and the female in this um, particular category is that the females have two black dots and the males only have a single black dot. Then we've got the clouded sulfur. Um, on the right, and then the plain sulfur um, bottom middle. All right, these are um, these butterflies like to um, hang out on some of our more common plants. They're called cabbage whites because the caterpillars do, in fact, hang out on cabbages, and they also um, feel radishes and um, other plants that are in the cabbage family. The nectar plants for these are um, pretty much any of the um, asters shaped or um, daisy shaped sorts of flowers, um, daisy fleabane being one of them, and so on. Yeah, I meant, neglected to mention the, um, the host plant and the, cat and the nectar plant. Host plant is um, the plant that the caterpillars will eat the leaves of. Whereas the nectar plant is what the adult butterfly um, drinks the nectar from. Both types of plants are necessary for um, a healthy butterfly population. So here's the cabbage white life cycle. Um, their egg laying behavior is a little bit different. Um, they don't lay single eggs, they lay their eggs in a cluster. Um, they hatch into that um, same small tiny little caterpillar, which then grows into this green fuzzy sort of looking caterpillar with a yellow stripe. And then the um, odd shaped chrysalis that they put onto a stem. We will, during the count, be looking for immature forms as well. So if we find eggs and or caterpillars, we will be counting those um, along with the adult butterflies. Again, these are some of our more common butterflies, the coppers, hair streaks, and blues. Um, these are small butterflies. These are um, sometimes as small as three quarters of an inch up to an inch, maybe an inch and a half. Um, they're really lovely when they've got their wings open and when they've got their wings closed, um, they're a little bit more difficult to identify. 
This um, one in this slide is the American copper. It's about um, an inch to an inch and a quarter. Um, the nectar plants for the adult are um, butterfly milkweed, um, buttercups, clover, um, yarrow, zinnia, um, those types of plants. And the host plants are um, dock and sorrel type plants. So we see, do see a lot of these um, around the center. We also tend to see these fairly frequently doing a behavior that's called puddling, which is when the butterfly lands in a sort of a little mud puddle and um, drinks some of the liquid from it. That's one of the ways they get the necessary minerals into their diet. So a lot of times we'll see um, butterflies doing what we call puddling. Okay, this is the gray hair streak. So one of the ways that you can identify this one, and since we usually see them with their wings closed, is by those um, orange spots on their, um, the underside of their hind wing. These um, nectar plants, um, they particularly like Queen Anne's lace, goldenrod, um, some of the vetches like crown vetch, um, and milkweeds, and they like dogbane as well. So we have a lot of those kinds of plants around the center, so I'm hopeful that we'll be able to see some of these um, in, in our count. The caterpillar host plants um, are clover, vetch, um, hibiscus, hollyhock, um, passion flowers. We don't have very many of those plants around the center, um, except for the clover, but we do um, see these guys a lot. Okay, this is the um, eastern tailed blue. If you take a look at the hind wings, you can see it's got those tiny little tails um, hanging out of it. Um, these are really small. These are maybe three quarters of an inch. Um, we see them fairly frequently um, because we they like clover and uh, pea vine and vetch, and we do have lots of clover. Um, so these are the kinds of small little butterflies that kind of are flying around your feet as you're walking through um, through a field and there's clover. They do a lot of puddling as well. All right. All right, this butterfly um, is the morning cloak. It's in a family of uh, butterflies called brushfoots. They're called brushfoots because um, two of their feet, of their six, are very small um, and sort of brush-like, I guess, for lack of a better term. So it often looks like they only have um, four legs instead of, instead of six. The morning cloak is um, one of our very first butterflies that we see. Um, it's a fairly big butterfly, roughly maybe two, maybe three inches across. Um, they hibernate um, and migrate both as, as adults. They come out um, very early in the spring because the adults like tree sap as their um, primary food. And when the spring comes and the sap first starts running into in the trees, um, it can tend to leak out of some cracks in the bark. So that's how they, how they get their food. Um, for the caterpillars, their host plants are um, black willow, ironwood, um, elms, which we don't have too many of, um, and uh, black alder as well. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to see some of these, even though the adults are um, fairly short-lived, we may be able to find some of the, uh, the caterpillars around because those plants we do have um, down near our pond and in the, uh, the marsh area at the headwaters of the pond. So we'll be looking for these when we go down towards the pond during our hike. Here is the uh, morning cloak life cycle. They um, have an interesting egg laying pattern. They lay their eggs in a kind of a collar around a small twig. Um, and they hatch into these bristly um, little caterpillars that unfortunately to some people look a lot like gypsy moths. So um, don't go smashing caterpillars um, until you've well identified them because although these look like gypsy moth caterpillars to a certain extent, they are not. Um, and then, of course, their chrysalis looks like a dead leaf. 
So that's um, something that we can, can look for as well. Here are um, a couple of other uh, brushfoots. These are um, fritillaries. This is a variegated fritillary. Um, this is about a, a two inch or so butterfly. Um, their host plants um, include may apples, violets, um, stone crops, which is kind of a seed, a moon seed, which uh, is a lot like um, wild grape. And the adult food, um, again, is dogbane. Um, the milkweed family, um, tick seeds on flowers are something that they like as well, um, and red clover. So we do see these as well. These are really pretty butterflies. Here's their life cycle. Um, they lay their eggs singly on their host plant. Um, you can see the, the growth of the caterpillar. Almost all butterflies, when they're ready to go into their chrysalis, um, you'll see on the bottom left of the slide, that they make this sort of J-shaped um, formation in their bodies, so they hang upside down, so they can then form the chrysalis around themselves, um, attached securely to their support structure. Most chrysalises are very well camouflaged, um, looking like, you know, dead leaves or twigs, and that sort of thing, um, which helps keep them safe during the transition into their metamorphosis. Still on the brush foots. Um, that top uh, picture is um, the egg of the common buckeye, which is um, what that butterfly is. A lot of people mistake this one for a moth because of the coloring, but it's not. It's a, it's a butterfly. Again, look, looking at the chrysalis, you can see that it looks uh, very much like a, a piece of a dead leaf. Um, these guys like plantain. Um, and false flock and foxglove for their um, host plant for their caterpillars, and then their nectar uh, plants are any flowers with a with a short throat because these butterflies have very short proboscis, so they're looking for flowers that are pretty flat where they don't have to reach very far down into the throat of the flower to find the nectar. So you wouldn't find them on things like honeysuckle where there's a deep throat. Um, you'd find them more on a, a flatter type of plants, perhaps yarrow um, or something like that would be where, where they can reach the nectar with their short proboscis. Okay, still on the brushfoots. Um, just to make this more confusing, this is not one of the swallowtails. This is a red spotted purple, um, really pretty um, butterfly. And you don't see the red spots until it holds up its wing. So you can see um, on the underside of the wing that you have all those lovely little red spots. Um, we don't see too many of these um, at the center. Um, we have seen them a couple of times, but they're not one of our more common butterflies. This is one of our more common butterflies. This is a red admiral. We see these fairly, fairly regularly. Um, again, a really attractive um, butterfly, not very big only about an inch and a half, maybe maybe two inches. Uh, the Red Admiral um, adult likes um, sap flows on trees more, very much like the morning cloak does. They also um, will be looking for um, rotting fruit and believe it or not, um, bird droppings. They visit flowers rarely, so only when those other food sources are, are not available. When they need to, they will take nectar from um, common milkweed, um, red clover, um, and asters. But the host plants um, are things for the caterpillar. They like um, the nettle family, wild nettles, wood nettles, um, and probably also things like hops. Um, sting nettle would be included in their, in their um, food plants as well. All right. Our next class of butterflies are called hackberry butterflies, um, also called emperors. So these um, butterflies generally overwinter as eggs, so they're um, more likely to be seen sort of midsummer. The caterpillars feed on leaves um, and tender growth of hackberry trees, hence the, the name. Um, they're also found on the 
the adults are found on the foliage and other flowers and other host plants. They do rest sometimes on the ground and they also will feed on sap from um, broken branches or wounds in the trees. Another class of butterflies are the satyrs and wood nymphs. Okay, these are more small, medium size, I guess I would say, inch and a half to two inches. Um, not very colorful, often confused for moths. Another group of butterflies that likes um, to have uh, rotting fruit around, which they will take the juices from. They like really large, sunny, grassy areas. Um, so open meadows are a place where we'll find these. So as we go towards the, um, the ag fields during our walk, these are the ones that we'll be looking for there. We have, um, gosh, I think this one is the little wood. No, this one, no, sorry, this one is the common wood nymph. Again, these are gonna be somewhat difficult to identify. So we're gonna want our binoculars on these. They're gonna be a little bit more challenging than some of the others. All right, now our favorites, the milkweed butterflies. This is a monarch. And there's a way to tell the difference between the males and the females of monarchs. Here's your next quiz. How can you tell the difference between the boys and the girls of the monarch butterflies? Anyone? Somebody must know. Stacy, you know? I do. It's the spots on their underwings. Okay. <laughs> you, Laura knows too. The boys have the spots. <laughs> the boys have the spots. That's exactly right. The boys have the spots. All right, and uh, we're right there. You see the, um, the caterpillar for a milkweed and for a monarch butterfly, also a milkweed butterfly. Okay, so here's a picture showing the difference between the male and the female. Okay, the, the spots are on the male. The female does not have them. And here's the life cycle. Um, for the caterpillar, I could not get a good picture of the egg, but um, it did. The eggs of the milk of the monarch do look like um, the ones that you saw from the buckeye. They're kind of little shaped, um, very small eggs, laid singly, almost entirely on the leaves of milk, either butterfly weed, um, swamp milkweed, or common milkweed. The uh, caterpillars, um, even when they're very small and um, are in their early instars have this striped um, yellow black um, coloration and their their um, chrysalis um, go from a solid opaque green to um, a very translucent um, form where you can actually see the colors of the butterfly within stacy how many monarchs did we successfully hatch and tag when we did that a couple years ago do you remember? Was it about a dozen? I was going to say like 10. Um, yeah, it was actually a lot of fun. We found the caterpillars and made sure they had lots of fresh milkweed to eat and watch them get bigger. It was, I think, as much fun for the staff as for any of the kids who got to see them. But um, <laughs> we had a great time and then we tagged them um, and then um, had it recorded. It's, it's a project um, that records their migration down to uh, Mexico. I don't know that we ever heard anything back from any of our butterflies, did we? I think you can go online if you have the like numbers and see, but I, I never did. <laughs> yeah. So um, one of the one of the things about monarchs um, is the coloration that the coloration of orange and black is uh, usually a signal to almost everything in the natural natural world that this is not a good thing to eat. Um, that that coloration is a warning sign. That, um, that it might be toxic. And in fact, um, monarchs um, can be toxic because the caterpillars, when they eat the leaves of the milkweed plants, um, which are full of oxalic acid, um, they take that into their bodies and then that can be quite hazardous to any predator that wants to eat them, um, including birds. So um, other animals have taken advantage of this fact 
And on the left, we have um, a butterfly that is trying to mimic a monarch. Um, this is um, the Viceroy. And you can see the main difference, the way you can tell the difference between the Viceroy and the monarch is the stripe along the hind wings that mimics the curve of the hind wing. The monarch on the right-hand side does not have that, um, whereas the Viceroy does. And just a little bit about um, monarch migration. Um, monarchs um, are really fascinating um, in their in their migration. They they spend a lot of their winter in Mexico and some parts of Southern California. Um, if a monarch is living on the East Coast, um, it migrates to Mexico and has to um, fly pretty much across the Gulf of Mexico to get into um, the area of Mexico where it's going to spend the winter. Now, um, one of the things that scientists still have not figured out about monarchs is how they know um, where to go during their northward migration because the butterflies that are coming north in the spring are the great great grandchildren of the butterflies that flew south. So they have the scientists have not yet figured out how they can do that. Um, nor do they know um, how the monarchs know which um, trees are safe for them to go hibernate in Mexico because again, there's several generations removed from um, the, the monarchs that flew north. So it's a fascinating study that we still um, haven't gotten to the bottom of. All right, so if you want to um, provide some um, help for monarchs um, and Lordy knows that they, they need all help they can get. Um, monarch way stations where there's a lot of common milkweed being planted or support for the Monarch Butterfly Sanctuary Foundation um, are all good things. We, um, we have been trying at, um, at, our, at our site to um, encourage the milkweed to grow. We do have some several very um, healthy stands of common milkweed. Um, and it's not it's not the easiest plant to uh, to grow from seed, but it, it can be done. The seed um, takes a little bit of cold um, and striation before it it'll actually um, sprout in the spring, but it can be done. Um, or you can get plants from some of your um, native plant suppliers, um, especially um, like the swamp milkweed. I found is much easier to transplant than the common milkweed, at least in at least in my yard. Um, and it's just as supportive for monarchs as the, the common milkweed. All right, I believe that is the end of the slides. Yes, let me stop sharing. All right. So questions, comments, things you want to know. What should you wear on Saturday when you come? Wear something that's appropriate for the weather. Um, Try not to wear bug spray. We don't want to scare the butterflies away, <laughs> but do wear sunscreen. We're going to be out um, at two o'clock in the afternoon, so it'll be uh, it'll be hot. Wear a hat, bring water, and don't forget your mask. No questions. I have a question for you, Diane. So, oh, actually, Adrian has a question. I'll, I'll do hers first. Um, what is the difference between the milkweed plants? Okay, well, um, milkweeds are Asclepius. That's the, the Latin name. Um, and the basic difference is they like different kinds of habitats. The swamp milkweed likes it where it's a little bit wetter, as you would guess from the name. The flowers are differently shaped. Um, the common milkweed flower is kind of um, like a big ball with lots of little florets on it. Um, swamp milkweed, it has got more of a, a flat um, kind of this sort of shape as does the butterfly weed. Butterfly weed is also orange and not pink, um, but they're just subspecies of Asclepius. The names again, butterfly weed is the orange one. It's a, it's a lower growing plant than the common milkweed. Common milkweed gets probably about four foot tall um, and has the, um, it has their flowers that are, it's kind of a ball shaped and it has those classic um, seed pods that are um, 
kind of teardrop shaped. Um, and when they split open, they've got the, the large dandelion shaped um, seed, seeds that fly away as almost like parachutes with a little seed underneath. And then the sm swamp milkweed is also a pink flower. It's more towards the hot pink or fuchsia color, if I could say that. Um, and it's got a flatter shape, more, um, yeah, just a flatter type shape, not, not the ball. So butterfly weed is shorter and orange. Swamp milkweed is also three and a half to four feet or so with a flatter flower. And then the common milkweed is kind of a, a dusty pink sort of, maybe raspberry sort of color. Um, with the flower in the shape of a ball. All of them are um, appropriate for any of the milkweed butterflies. Adrian saying that so she has the common milkweed and it's attracting lots of bees, but not butterflies. There still might be time. Don't don't worry. They, yeah, they it's usually. A, it's, yeah. it's a little early. <laughs> it's still a little early for monarchs. I've seen maybe three or four so far this spring. But we do want to support all of our pollinators. Um, butterflies are pollinators as well as bees, and we want to support all of our pollinators. So I'm glad that you have um, the common milkweed and that the bees are loving it. Hey, Diane, it's Phil. Hi, Phil. Hey. Yeah, I just saw that uh, someone typed something about old, and I was reading about the common milkweed. They said it would be good to cut some of them when they get old because the caterpillars like to eat the younger leaves. So apparently once they've done flowering and they start to get old and leathery, it's good to you know, knock a few of them, chop them off and let some shoots come up so that you've got some nice fresh leaves for the young ones. Yeah, absolutely, great idea. Yeah. Um, I'm not gonna be able to make it on Saturday, but is this like the Christmas bird count where anybody can do a count at their own house or anywhere they want? Um. The, the compiler for this count is um, uh, Marianne Borge, who, is op who operates out of Bowman's Hill. Our circle areas are um, a 15 mile diameter, so your house would be within the circle. Um, so yeah, I think you could count at your house. Um, I can, if you want, I can send you the checklist so that you'll, you'll have it. Um, mm -hmm. And then you'll just have to identify for her where your house is located within the circle. Or you can send it to me and I, and I can do that for you. Okay. And then is it have to be that day, Saturday, or is there a day or so leeway? Because I just saw a cloudless sulfur today, which was. Oh, it, it, it's supposed to be that day. Yeah, it has to be that day. It's not like the Christmas bird count where they give you, you know, a, a period of, you know, a week or and a half or so. Um, just like we do with Christmas bird count, we do our count on a given day and, and Saturday is the given day. And you've been seeing a lot more butterflies than one year you had one butterfly you saw, right? And now yeah, that was, a, that was a few years ago. That was before um, we turned the um, North and South Ag Field over to Carversville Farm Foundation. That was, that was the year that the farmer, um, changed over from hay to corn by killing all of the hay off and putting corn in and we had no butterflies that year. And how many now are you seeing in general? Um, last year we had we had one of our better counts. I don't honestly I don't remember the number but it was it was quite a satisfying count. Um, I did go out and do a little scouting today. Um, probably not the best day for it as it was kind of windy and kind of cloudy. And I was kind of, I was disappointed in the number of butterflies I saw. Um, on other days where it's been sunnier, I've seen quite a number of, um, tig of swallowtails, tiger swallowtails. And like I said, a couple of monarchs. Um, always cabbage whites though. We always see the cabbage whites. So we'll see how we do Saturday. Hopefully the weather will be um, cooperative for us. Yeah, something would be nice to plant in that wetland. I have a button bush here. We have a couple of button bush in there. And boy, I would I counted uh, like a dozen yellow swallowtails on the button bushes, but this year I haven't seen one on it, which is scary. You know, like I don't know why, but normally I see a dozen and not a one. Your button bush is blooming already. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. been a couple of days now. Yeah, well, we will we'll we'll go down into the marsh area and have a, have a look. A lot of times, 
in on those mud flats that we have down there, we'll we'll find a lot of tiger swallowtails puddling down there. So we'll we'll take a look and see what we, we see. It, I have um, I've heard from other people um, in the uh, in the Facebook group, the Pennsylvania um, native plant group, that people are not seeing butterflies as well. Um, now we have had a very um, rainy spring, so I'm not going to get too discouraged yet, but. Um, we may be on the on the low side again this year just because the weather hasn't been very cooperative. A couple other great observations. Um, Laura mentions that she doesn't tend to see swallowtails until um, the Joe Pye weed starts to bloom. Um, and Robert also makes the observation that all the insects this year seem to be just a little bit behind than they normally would come. I saw a red spotted purple just this afternoon here, got some nice photos of it. Beautiful butterfly. Yeah. That's one of my favorite butterflies. They're really pretty. I'll see if I can catch it and bring it over for you on Saturday then. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. Don't go catching butterflies. Just leave yeah. it. Be. It's happy where it is. Let it go make little baby butterflies. All right, anybody else? I don't see any other questions. We want to thank everybody very, very much um, for coming. Um, and again, if you want to come out with Diane and do the butterfly count with her, um, that is going to be this Saturday, the 18th at two o'clock. Um, there, there is a fee. The North American Butterfly Association does require that everybody that participates contribute um, $3 for the uh, maintenance of the data and so forth. So um, we will ask for a $3 donation for the North American Butterfly Count. Plus, if you want to add something for us, we'd love to have that too. <laughs> and you can do that online if you want to take care of it ahead of time. All right, we All right. are, we are, I know we did schedule this for half an hour, so we are a little bit over and I want to thank everybody for participating. And I hope to see you all out on Saturday. Socially distant mask wearing butterfly count. Sounds great. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Very informative. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.